In Chapter 2, we consider one of the most important applications uh, in scientific computing relates to the solution of linear systems of equations. So in this chapter, we're going to just study various methods that we can use and certainly program in Python to solve um, small, medium, and even large, very large linear systems that arise in physical applications. A lot of this is perhaps a review of Math 251, Linear Algebra, which is a prerequisite for this course. Um, so some of this material you should have had, but if not, this will be a good review and we'll go through some of the definitions and some of the mechanics that are involved in uh, setting up matrix equations and how to solve them. Um, we will discuss various methods that some you'll be familiar with and some you will not because they'll be different, uh, more advanced techniques that we use in scientific computing. So we'll start off with an augmented coefficient matrix defining what that is. So a linear system of equations would look something like what you have on your screen where the A's, uh, which are doubly subscripted, represent scalars or real numbers and then the X uh, subscripts, X1, X2 through Xn, represent the unknowns that we're interested in solving for. And then um, the B's, B1, B2, up through Bn, also represent scalars. So this represents a linear system of equations because the uh, if you think about the unknowns, uh, the xi's, you only see them to the first power. You don't see any squares or higher dimensions on those uh, unknowns. If they were, those would be this would def would reflect what would be called a nonlinear system of equations, which actually we will talk about later on. But for now, these are linear systems, so there's just simple scalars multiplied by these. Um, unknown uh, quantities x1 through xn. So um, the way you can define uh, in terms of a matrix equation a linear system like this is to write a simple matrix times a vector and set that equal to another vector. So what we'll do is we'll start off and just take each of these equations and write it as if we were um, writing it in a, um, uh, a matrix vector product. So how could we do that? We could take each one of these uh, coefficients, and we'll just start off with the first row, a1, 1, um, and then we'll take the next one in order, a1, 2. Again, these would represent real values, and I'm going to use dot, dot, dots just to reflect that the sequence would continue on um, through a1, n. In other words, notice that the first subscript represents the row, and the second subscript represents the column. So that represents the first row of our matrix. And uh, accordingly, if we did the same thing for the next row of the matrix, you would have A21 followed by uh, A22. And again, that would continue on till you got to A2N. Okay. And then just, you know, continuing on the process, we would end up down to the nth row written down here and that would continue on to the last element in the corner down there. So this is a diagonal there, um, is A and N. And so this represents a coefficient matrix. Okay, There are N rows and N columns. And we'll, for the assumption here, assume that, you know, we can assume this is what we call a dense linear system, which means that every one of those A's has a, has a number in it. Um, Let's just assume it's not zero, but some of them could be zeros. But for, for now, we'll just assume that they're, they're all um, numbers that are not zero. Um, so in writing this linear system of equations in a matrix form, the left-hand side of the equal signs would be equivalent to this matrix times this vector x1, x2, up through xn. Meaning, if you took the first row here and multiplied and took the, excuse me, if you took this first row and took the dot product of this first row with this column vector here, x1 through xn, you would in fact get this expression right there. That literally is that dot product. Same thing if you took the second row and multiply, and didn't, I keep saying multiply, but take the dot product with the second row and this, ve and this vector, you would get the second row there. And then, of course, 
that so that reconstructs the left hand side and this has to be equal to those b's and that would just form another vector b1 b2 all the way up through bn so this in fact this whole expression here is a reflection of a matrix we'll call a times a vector that's called x and I'll use the vector notation like that equals the vector b like this so this linear system is described by this matrix notation. Um, now, so in using the term augmented coefficient matrix, sometimes it's a lot easier just to represent uh, all the values that we're working with. In this form, we would take the matrix A and then append the right-hand side B, and that would be sort of the matrix or the augmented coefficient matrix that would describe the linear system, meaning that the x1 through the xn is implied, okay? So this form would just simply be this matrix with the straight line, and then we would append the b's, and this is called the augmented coefficient matrix right there. Okay. Um, and this may be, this will be what we use as augmented coefficient matrix down here, these values of A arranged like this with the line and then B, whatever the B's are, this is what we'll be using to, um, to mechanically solve the linear system. When we say solving the linear system, A's are known, the B's are known, this is what we're trying to figure out. What's the linear combination of the A's that will give you the corresponding B's? Okay. And each... Uh, in each case, you know, x1 through xn are not known, and that's the goal. So finding this vector x is what we call um, solving the, the linear system. Okay. So what can we say about the uniqueness of a solution of linear systems? Again, using linear algebra to describe the system, the coefficient matrix A, which we just illustrated earlier, you would say that the solution of the linear system, Ax equals b, is unique if that matrix A is what we call non-singular. Uh, a couple other ways to say that is that, well, that means that the determinant of that matrix, represented by this DET of A or two vertical lines in A, that's also another way of writing the determinant, if that determinant is non-zero, equivalently, the, another way of saying a matrix is not a singular, if the rows of A and the columns of A are linearly independent, which means you couldn't, cons you couldn't reconstruct one of the uh, rows or columns by taking combinations of the other rows or columns, respectively. If the matrix is singular, which means it's not non-singular, or for example, the determinant is zero, or you've got or, you know, rows that are dependent or columns that are dependent, then the solution has either no solutions at all or an infinite number of solutions. Um, and I'm going to illustrate that for you with a very simple example. So let's look at uh, a very simple two by two linear system. So if I was to write a linear system like this, two x plus um, y equals three. Again, the unknowns are x and y. I'm not using x1 and x2, but I could. It's just different representation of the variables. And then another linear system, again, thinking of your linear algebra class, you might have something very simple like this to solve. Um, 4x plus 2y equals 6. So, again, that's two equations and two unknowns. The x and the y are unknown. And what's interesting here is that if you look very carefully, you might notice that the second equation here, or if we even say if we even called that row two, so to speak, you could see that row two is actually just two times row one. In other words, if you were to take row one and multiply it all the way through by two, you would get that second row there, okay, or the second equation, if you like. So here's an illustration that those rows are not linearly independent. And in this particular case, anything that's any combination of x and y that solves the first equation also solves the second equation. 
So this is an example of having an infinite number of solutions. Similarly, if we were to make a slight change in the linear system, in other words, suppose that we left the first row as it is, 2x plus y equals 3, and let's suppose that we took the second row, or the second equation, if we want to call it that, almost the same way, 4x plus 2y, but now I'm not going to make it uh, linearly dependent by putting equal 6. Suppose I made it equal to 0. Okay. Now, in this particular case, um, the uh, determinant is 0, uh, in, in, as well as the first time. So it turns out either case, if the matrix A, if we look at the matrix A in this case, it's going to be 2, 1, 4, 2. Okay, so that this is what A is equal to. Oops, that's, uh, I'm not trying to select that, so let's try that again. If we take the representation here of the matrix, and we call that equal to A, then if you remember from linear algebra, the way you take the, de the determinant is you take the cross product, you take the diagonal cross product, 2 times 2, and get 4. So the determinant of this matrix A is 2 times 2 minus the quantity taking the other diagonal, for the product of the elements in the other diagonal. So um, so that would be the determinant of A is equal to 2 times 2, the forward diagonal, minus the product of the anti-diagonal, 4 times 1. That's the definition of the determinant for a 2 by 2 matrix. And you can see clearly that's equal to 0. So this matrix is singular, and it's the same coefficient matrix for both of these examples. So either one of them is has an infinite solution and the other one has none. So the top one we just showed has an infinite number. The bottom one in this case has no solution. Just illustrating possibilities. So there's no solution on the bottom one. Because if, you, if you're going to say at the bottom, 4x plus 2y equals 0, then if you thought about, well, I, if I divided, I could divide the, the second equation by 2 and it would not change anything. The equality there would not change. But if you divide the second equation by 2, you're going to get 2x plus y equals 0, correct? Now look at what's going on at the top equation. How can 2x plus y equal 0 and also 2x plus y equal 3. And that's the problem. You couldn't. And so therefore, this small little example, this 2 by 2, has no solutions. So if you find out that the matrix, the determinant of the matrix is 0, that implies, of course, the matrix is singular. And either you've got an infinite number of solutions or no solution at all. Sometimes when you're solving linear systems, you may not get the, the, the correct solution or the solution that you're hoping to. And you might think that there's a problem with the algorithm or the code that you've, you've written for a particular method or algorithm. But there is a case of, uh, that comes up sometimes in which the coefficient matrix is ill-conditioned. So this is the case when that matrix A from the linear system AX equals B, the matrix notation that we've talked about before. Again, we typically write A, and I might use vectors on the X and the B, so we're looking at how we solve AX equals B. There may be cases when that matrix A is nearly singular. In other words, we know it would be singular if the determinant is equal to zero, and again, no solution or infinite number. But what if it's not exactly zero, but it tends to be very small? It's getting close to zero for some reason. That can be problematic in terms of getting a, an accurate solution to the system, linear system. Now, you can always estimate the determinant because doing it for a two by two like we just did is fairly simple. Any, most humans can do that. Three by three is a little bit more complicated. 
but you may or may not remember from linear algebra. When you get into dimension four or five or six, it would be very complicated for a human to do that without making an error. It's a lot easier actually to do it on a computer. But there's another way you can uh, estimate it by just getting a bound on a matrix norm. In other words, you can estimate the determinant by not using a norm as an upper bound, that it won't be any bigger than this particular norm, which is usually easier to compute. And there's library function calls available, certainly in Python and most, lang and most scientific computing environments that provide these types of norms. And I'll just illustrate a few of them for you. Um, in other words, if that norm gets very, very small and it's an upper bound for the determinant, then you can bet that the determinant is going to be very small and therefore your system is you know, potentially ill-conditioned. So one of the common matrix norms that is very computable, doesn't come for free, but it is what's called the Frobenius norm, and we use the subscript F. Okay? This stands for Frobenius. It's for a name, the mathematician, Frobenius. And that's an I there. So the Frobenius norm is simply computed as the square root of the square, sum of squares of all the elements. So you would need to sum over all the rows. So I goes from 1 to, let's say, N. And you would also go from J equals 1 to n, because it's an n by n matrix, and just sum up all of the squares. So you'd have i, j, a sub i, j, and then the quantity squared. So you'd sum up all the squares, elements of all the matrix, and take the square root. That will give you some estimate of the norm, or you could say roughly like the size of the average element of the matrix. Okay. Another very common, easier to compute matrix norm is what we call the infinity norm, subscript infinity sign. And that simply is the maximum of i running from 1 up through n. So this is i. Okay greater than or equal to 1, less than or equal to n, of the sum of j running from 1 to n of the absolute value of a, i, j. So again, we would be summing up. Now, if you think about the fact that the j is summing from 1 to n, that is on the column index there, right? So what you're doing is you're actually computing column sums of all of the magnitudes because we've got absolute value there. Our signs are not what we're interested in. We're not going to do any subtractions. We're simply trying to see how big the elements are in magnitude. Take all of those, take, this is computing a column sum. So we're actually trying to find the maximum column sum. again, of magnitudes. I'm going to abbreviate that. In other words, the absolute value. Okay. So the infinity norm is another nice way of getting an estimate of the sizing of the elements. And again, if that turned out to be very small, either the Frobenius or the infinity matrix norm, you could be pretty much guaranteed that that matrix is probably very ill-conditioned because the determinant is probably going to be very small. So we just looked at the fact that a bound on the determinant might give us a clue about ill conditioning. There's another way by computing a particular value called the condition number of the matrix. Say again, you would have a linear system and we would be looking at the coefficient matrix composed of those elements to the left of the equal sign and look at all those uh, the in rows and in columns. The condition number would be the product of um, the matrix norm and the norm of its inverse, which again is sometimes not so easy to get, and you may argue, well, if I had the inverse, I could solve the linear system. 
But this is a, a sort of a theoretical argument, again, of looking at how we could size up the likelihood that something would be ill-conditioned. We would say that if the condition number of a matrix is equal to 1, then the matrix is well-conditioned. Of course, the condition number is not unique. It depends on what norm you choose, the infinity or the Frobenius, for example. Um, and it's expensive to compute, obviously, if, if you have to get an estimate of the inverse as well. So we do typically compare the determinant to the magnitudes of the matrix A elements just because it's a lot easier. But formally, the condition number, in theory, is one way to um, solidify an assessment of, of ill conditioning. Let's go back and do a little example of ill conditioning from a standpoint of what uh, a solution looks like and, and a determinant. So let's go back and look at the example we had before where the first row was 2x plus um, y equals 3. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a slight change to that. And suppose the second row was 2x plus um, 1.00 1 y equals 0. Okay. So first thing to notice, they're not dependent because I've slightly changed the y and did not change, uh, I mean I changed the coefficient on the y term. You can see how much I've adjusted. This one's 1 and this one is 1 .00, um, uh, 0.001 and um, Write that again. Okay. And uh, so what we've got is a, a, you know a system that doesn't look off offhand is 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 being um, uh, singular because the the rows look like they're they're not linearly dependent columns either. So that looks like it might not have a problem. So. It turns out if you were to compute um, the determinant of the coefficient matrix, okay, let's, what is the coefficient matrix? It's 2, 1, 2, 1 point zero, zero, 1. That is what the matrix A is. And you can show that the determinant of that matrix, if you compute it like we did before, um, you would show that it was point zero zero two which is rather small it's very much smaller than all the elements of the matrix it's almost you could argue almost three orders of magnitude smaller because this is on, on the order of that's tens hundreds that's thousands okay two that's an order of two one thousandths so um, very much smaller than matrix elements. So this is ripe for ill conditioning. So if you were to solve this linear system, it does have a solution. Uh, in this case, it's x would have to be 1,501, um, 1,501.5, and y would have to be, in this case, actually negative 3,000. So, what do we know? It's not exactly singular. I mean, there is a solution. Remember, if it was singular, which means the determinant would be zero, then there's either an infinite number or not a solution at all. So there is a solution here. But what's problematic is the fact that this determinant is so much smaller than the matrix elements. Again, potentially being ripe for ill conditioning. Okay. So that's great, but we still may not have an understanding of what does it mean to be ill conditioned, other than the fact that, okay, there, it's triggered by this event that we just pointed out that, okay, this, so the determinant's not zero, but it's so much smaller than the matrix elements in size it sounds like something bad can happen. So let me illustrate what 
what property this, this linear system has, or this matrix A has in terms of the determinant with regard to what could happen to the solution if I make a slight change. So let's look at just making a slight change in the second equation of this small 2x2 two two linear system we've been looking at. So again, the first row is indicated here, 2x plus y equals 3, so we had before. And now I'm making a slight change to the coefficient in front of the y in the second row. So in particular, we're assuming it now to be 2x plus 1.002y. Remember before that this coefficient on that equation was 1.001y equals 0. So what we've done is we've made a slight change. What if we wanted to quantify the change? The change, if I just use you know the Greek letter delta there, the, the change was just in one element, the coefficient in front of the y, and it's just a change of point um, zero zero one. We made a slight perturbation to the matrix A, right? And the right hand side is still the same. Um, if you were to solve this new linear system, which is for practical purposes almost like the one we had before, and remember the solution before, just for the sake of the argument, the previous solution looked like this. x is equal to um, 1,501.5, and y was equal to what? Uh, negative 3,000. If you solve this linear system here with that slight change to the coefficient on the y there, turns out the solution there would be x equals 751.5 and y would be equal to y would be equal to negative 1500. Look at the difference. That's almost half of what the original x is and half of the original y, with only a small little change. In fact, if you wanted to quantify it, what we could say is in terms of percentage, that's like a 0.1% change in the coefficient matrix A, coefficient matrix A made because it's a, twi it's a doubling effect in some sense or halving effect. You could say it's a 100% change in the solution. The original solution is twice the size of, the of, this new, of this perturbed system. So that is a marquee property of ill conditioning. If you can make small changes in the coefficient matrix and achieve large perturbations or changes in the solution, you most likely have an ill-conditioned system at hand. And so that just means that the physical system, whether it comes from chemistry or physics or whatever, is very, very sensitive to the construction of those uh, linear equations. And so the solution can greatly change with just a minor, minor recording error or noise or whatever that could slightly change the equations. So it's something to be aware of when you notice that the solutions are, if this is a, if if it's representing a time sort of series problem and the system of equations describes the solution at a particular time and you notice that there's a big jump in the solution, then it could be reflective of an ill-conditioned linear system. We're going to talk about two different overall approaches to solving linear systems now that we've talked a little about some other properties of them. Um, it'll fall into two camps, either what we call a direct method or an iterative method. Um, in the next lecture, we'll start with direct methods and then eventually we'll work our way towards iterative methods. Sometimes they're called indirect methods. Direct methods are based on uh, an approach that you should have seen in Math 251 or in any linear algebra class, that is using what we call elementary operations or ele elementary row operations that basically do not change the linear system, the solution of the linear system, it does not augment it. It just helps you um, perform a, provide a reduced form of the 
augmented coefficient matrix that helps you read off what the solution would be. The three basic elementary operations that you do for these kinds of direct methods, number one is that you can exchange two rows. You can make the first row of the linear system the last row or the, exchange the third one, the fifth one. That will not change your solution. It changes the, you know, the order of the x sub i's and the unknown. Um, but you should know that it will change the sign of the determinant. Every time you make a switch like that, the determinant SIGN will flip. Um, another uh, elementary operation, sometimes people call it row operation, is that you could multiply an equation by any non-zero constant. That will not change the solution. We talked about that earlier in terms of looking at dependencies. If you multiply the number 2 or 4 or 10 or 1 half all the way through on both sides of the equal sign. It does not change the solution. The x's are preserved. The determinant though is changed when you do that and it changes by that constant amount. So you have to be careful if you're, for example, dividing through by very large numbers. You could see what could potentially happen is that you might ultimately get a determinant that's getting closer to zero and that means almost singular which means no solution or infinite number of solutions so you do have to be careful about what you're multiplying and then lastly or thirdly you can multiply each equation by that non-zero constant and then and then subtract it from another equation and if you do that the determinant is actually unchanged so you can multiply or scale any row let's say, by a value, and then subtract it from some other row. Um, and we'll see that how important that is in terms of getting a very nice form change in your um, augmented coefficient matrix that still represents the original linear system, You're still going to get the right answer, but you'll have a much more efficient way of pulling off what those unknowns are. Iterative methods are typically used for the case that you have a very large linear system, order of tens, hundreds, thousands, maybe million by million. And the, and the matrix A, the coefficient matrix, has really more zeros than non-zeros. Usually that becomes maybe from a geometry or a structure where not everything is dependent on each other. So it's very common in structural mechanics and chemistry and physics and some other applications um, to have sparse linear systems. And in those cases, we're not going to operate directly on the matrix. That's why it's not called a direct method or maybe called an indirect method. We're going to guess a solution to the linear system and then use the matrix A in a way to improve our initial guess and get hopefully closer and closer to the original solution.